I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon. Hey everybody, how are we doing? How's it going? Welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast, part of the 90 Min Football Network. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simu, a very flued up, uh, blocked nosed, um, achy, grumpy Harry Simu here uh, with you guys for this edition of the show. And we're not going to be, unfortunately, uh, talking about anything particularly positive on this episode of the podcast. Well, there might be some positive news potentially in the pipeline, but the first stop and the first port of call this time around is, of course, to discuss the Gabriel Jesus news. Now, we've known for a few days now that Gabriel Jesus sustained an injury. We've known for a few days that the outlook on Gabriel Jesus's injury isn't a particularly positive one. And uh, we've tried to kind of keep calm and, and remain, um, you know, as, as positive and as optimistic as possible. And today, Arsenal have confirmed that Gabriel Jesus has undergone surgery, which, whatever way you look at it, isn't good news because it means a sustained period of time out on the sidelines. We don't know exactly what the injury is. Arsenal don't go into uh, an awful lot of detail in this announcement, which we'll we'll delve into uh, in just a little bit. But, you know, on the one hand, you think, oh, maybe without surgery, it's not as long a recovery and maybe is OK. But I guess obviously they've taken that decision and they feel that it's something that needs to happen. Uh, it's probably to protect him for the long run. So, yeah, frustrating news. And, you know, I was very much one of those people that were saying over the last few days, look, it doesn't look good. The noises don't sound good, but let's kind of hold fire and see where this goes. Let's see what happens once he's back in Arsenal's hands, once they've had an opportunity uh, to take a look at the injury and the extent of it and, and carry out their own assessments. And uh, we thought that we were going to hear of some results today. We thought that we were going to hear of, um, you know, what Arsenal had found, essentially, albeit through the grapevine. But it seems that Arsenal have already gone ahead uh, and put Gabriel Jesus under the knife. That operation has already taken place. And uh, and we'll get into all the details and information around that in just a minute. We're also going to be talking Mikhailo Mudrik because the noise around him and a potential move to Arsenal just doesn't seem to be going away. We'll also talk Takahiro Tomiyasu, uh, who's been speaking about what he needs off the back of Japan's World Cup exit. We'll get into all of that on this live edition of the show. Just a quick reminder before we dive into it. If you haven't done so already, please leave a like on the video. If you're listening via a podcast platform, then please do subscribe and leave us a review. Actually, just, just on that note, in terms of reviews, there was a review that came through to me um, the other day and it said, um, Harry doesn't care about this podcast anymore. And Harry has uh, taken his foot off the gas with the Chronicles of Aguna and it's just simply not what it used to be. I promise you that once club football returns to centre stage, once the World Cup is done, we will get back to daily shows. But at this moment in time, the World Cup has taken over. You know, the past few days, OK, there's been Arsenal related news to discuss and we've done that uh, when it's come along. But do I want to be jumping on and making episodes for the sake of it? Probably not. So I promise you that this is not being neglected. The show is not being neglected and it's going to be bigger and better in the new year. I can promise you that. Um, but yeah, uh, just wanted to address that because uh, it's not that I don't enjoy doing it and I don't want to do it anymore and that I don't care about it. And it's not at the top of my priority list anymore. It absolutely is because everything I've been able to do over the past couple of years in this industry and field has been off the back of this podcast. So believe me when I say this is the most important piece of work that I do uh, on a daily, weekly basis. Uh, but as I say, the World Cup is on. There isn't an awful lot of noise around club football at this moment in time, uh, with the exception of some of the big stories. And I just didn't feel like it was worth uh, sitting there and um, basically making things up. Plus, on top of that, um, I, I talked the other day about how I just needed a bit of a break and, and a bit of time to kind of take my foot off the gas ahead of what's going to be a mad, crazy 
second part of the season. Uh, let's say a few hellos and get some of your initial thoughts and comments from the live chat box. Matt says, uh, I'm gutted, Harry. The only positive, he's talking about the Jesus news, obviously, is that it's happened before the transfer window opens. I don't think we'll bring in a striker, but hopefully we can tie up Mudrik quickly. We'll talk about Mudrik in a little bit. Clock in Seb says, full of cold, me too. Uh, gutted for Jesus and just dropped my pizza in the street. Other than that, I'm confident Arteta and Edu have developed the club enough to attract decent reinforcements in January. Mate, I'm gutted to hear about the pizza. What Was it in the box or, or did the box hit the ground open and the pizza went flying out? Let me know. I'm, I'm really curious because, yeah, what did you take out a slice and drop the slice? Did you drop the box and the box opened and spilled out onto the road? Let me know. But either way, it's heartbreak. Absolute heartbreak. Uh, wish you all the best, mate. Hopefully you have some better luck this evening. Uh, big hello to Tom, uh, who says about Jesus. Hopefully he won't wait until Easter to rise again or we are doomed. Doomed, he says. Um, Harvey says, uh, hello, Harry and everyone. Miss your shows, but understand there's not much content at the moment to talk about. Yeah, look, that's that's basically what it is. I'm doing quite a bit of work around the World Cup and my focus and attention has shifted to the World Cup. But also, as I said to you guys a few days ago, I'm quite enjoying the fact that my schedule is just a little bit less hectic because sometimes you need that. And, and obviously, when you get that, it, it puts you in a better shape and better position, I think, going into what's going to be crazy, um, a, a crazy second half of the season. I've already got some of my rotors and I know that I'm going to be absolutely swamped. So, yeah, I'm making the most of it at the moment. But when there is Arsenal news, of course, uh, we will discuss it. We will be here. Uh, big hello to Amira, to Xuzia, to Matt, uh, to Adam, who says we need him so badly. He is important. He really, really is. Uh, Smart Cookie says it isn't good, KSC. You need to splash the cash in January to even stay uh, in the uh, top four now. Uh, Havik says, uh, why is your head just hanging in the darkness? I've had a move around in the man cave. I've changed it all up a little bit, and I've just... Uh, not got around to putting the rest of the lighting in at the back end of the room. But yeah, I've got hands um, and, and shoulders and arms and all of that. Don't worry. Uh, big hello to Wandering Minstrel, to Mafia Boss. Um, James says, Harry, anyone uh, who says that you took your foot off the gas is a youngster. They just want click paint news. Uh, Haji Mohammed says, a big up bro, Harry. Much love from diehard Arsenal fans in Chennai, India. We've got... Um, Derek from Australia says, G'day, mate. G'day, mate. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, Avix speaking about um, Amrabat, who played really, really well for Morocco, didn't he, today? Again, he's been brilliant at the tournament, to be fair. I've got to just quickly, before we get full on in the Arsenal stuff, I know if you're sitting here waiting for the Arsenal stuff, you're probably thinking, get the hell on with it. But uh, obviously, the uh, World Cup has been pretty good so far, I would say. I've enjoyed a lot of it. And I've just logged on, jumped on here after watching Morocco stun Spain and, uh, and knock them out of the World Cup uh, in the round of 16. The Moroccans have been great value in this tournament. They defended valiantly today and uh, and they took it to penalties. And as you can see, when it comes to penalties, it can go either way. Uh, big hello to Jacob, to Lynn, to Roger, to Magnus and to everybody else in the chat. Right, let's um, let's pick apart then. Arsenal's statement regarding Gabriel Jesus. So the announcement came this afternoon. It's a very short one. Very, very short one. It says, Gabriel Jesus has undergone, I beg your pardon, Gabriel Jesus has successfully undergone surgery to his right knee after suffering an injury during the Brazil versus Cameroon World Cup group stage match on Friday. Gabby will now begin his rehabilitation program. Everyone at the club is supporting Gabby and will be working hard to get him back on the pitch as soon as possible. So there's no time frame. There's no further detail. There's no explanation with regards to the exact nature of the injury. Um, Arsenal are leaving that uh, out purposely, clearly. Look, it's a hard one, right? Because Arsenal want to manage the fans' expectations, right? Which is why they've put this out today. You know, the last few days since Friday, we've spoken a lot about this. There's been a lot of rumours going around. Is he going to be out for a month? Is he going to be out for three months? Is he going to be out for the rest of the season? Um, and Arsenal were radio silent. Now, obviously, they needed to get him back. They needed to assess the situation. They needed to work out exactly what was going on. 
uh, before they would be in a position to comment. But what they've had to do is give us some sort of update just to kind of quash some of the speculation. Although you could argue that with the announcement and the, the information that they've given us, they're still leaving a lot to people's imaginations. And that still leaves room for people to kind of add their own bits and pieces to this, um, draw their own conclusions, perhaps add exaggerations to the mix as well. We don't know how long Gabby Jesus is going to be out for. If I'm guessing, I'm thinking three months. Um, that's what I'm guessing. But again, I don't know the exact nature of the injury. And even if I did, I'm not a doctor. So this is purely a guess from my point of view. But I think we've got to be prepared for the fact that we're probably going to be without him now for, for at least three months, I would say. And that's not ideal. You know, there's a lot of big games coming up. We're in a great position when the Premier League returns, but we want to sustain that. We want to continue our charge. Uh, we want to keep some sort of continuity in the way that we've been playing. And Gabby Jesus, although he's found it hard in front of goal of late, has been so key in the way we play, in the way we build up, in the way we do things. He's added an intensity. He's added a quality. He's added uh, tenacity. He's added so much to that forward line. And he's added a sophistication to our attacking play that we just didn't have uh, prior to his arrival, if we're being completely honest. He's brought the best out of the players around him, um, you know. And unfortunately, now we're going to have to move on without him. And look, there's been a lot of talk over the last few days. What's the solution here? What would you do? Would you give Eddie and Ketia the responsibility? A player that we gave a new contract to in the summer. A player whom we signed up on a £100,000 a week deal. Is it time for Eddie and Ketia to step up? He's talked repeatedly about the fact that he's ready to take the chances and opportunities when they come his way. Well, this is a huge opportunity for Eddie and Ketia. But is he definitely, categorically, the best solution? I don't know. I really don't. I mean, the more I think about this, um, and, and it probably ties in a little bit with some of the other news that we're going to discuss today, the more I think that maybe Gabriel Martinelli is as good an option through the middle as Eddie and Ketia. But then all, uh, always you're worried about what that then takes away from the rest of an attack that has been very effective so far this season. Could you argue that taking Martinelli out of his position to play him through the middle and not having Jesus means that we're unsettling what's worked and, and um, you know, we're, we're moving away from what's worked when actually we probably don't need to do that and we don't need to disrupt two positions. And therefore, does Nketiah just come in as a like for like? Well, the truth is he's not a like for like. And that's my worry and that's my concern. He he has some similar attributes. I think Eddie Nketiah can press. I think he works hard. I think he pops up in the right areas. I think he's an accomplished finisher. I would back Eddie Nketiah to score goals in Arsenal's first team currently. Forget about what you see from him in the Carabao Cup, in the Europa League, when he's playing with a much-changed eleven, um, You know, I, I would back Eddie Nketiah to be more effective than we've seen him be so far this season in the games that he's played and, you know, during the opportunities that he's been given. But will he link up play in the way that Jesus does? No. Does he strike fear into centre-halves in the way that Jesus does? Is he as much of a nuisance as Jesus is? No. The truth is he's none of those things. And so, yeah, maybe we're going to have to adapt slightly the way we play. I would say that with all the things that Jesus brings, that Martinelli probably has more of those qualities, more of those attributes, and is probably a more like-for-like -like in the sense of he can be effective through the middle. But Jesus, if you look at his heat maps, likes to drift out wide. Martinelli would be able to drift out wide as well. And Ketia does it from time to time, but does he do it as effectively? I don't know. I'm I'm really sort of fighting with this in my mind because on the one hand, as I say to you, I think that I would, especially if Smith rose back, who returned to training today, by the way, took full part in training. He's doing ball and um and physical work as well. Um, you know, he's he's back in the mix, he's back in the picture. And then we'll talk about Mikhailo Mudrik as well uh, in a minute. Yeah, it's um you're sitting here and you're thinking, you know, does the, the return of Smith Rowe, does that open the door to allow Gabby Martinelli to move inside. But then at the same point, as I keep saying, you're you're essentially then disrupting two positions. And I don't know if that's the right thing to do either. So, um, yeah, hard one. 
difficult decisions for Mikel Arteta to make. Is he going to go out and bring in another striker in January? I highly doubt it. I highly doubt it. Now, I know that's not what people want to hear. I know people want to hear that Arsenal are going to go out and break the bank in January. I know people want to believe that Arsenal are going to look at what's happened to Gavi Jesus, look at where they are in the Premier League table and feel that they have no choice but to double down and to go out there and spend and try and maintain the level we've we've achieved so far this season to sustain the level of success. I just don't see it, if I'm being completely honest. I don't think this injury is going to change Arsenal's plans going into January an awful lot. And that takes me on nicely to the Mikhailo Mudrik chat because as far as as we're hearing, this is a play that Arsenal are very, very much interested in. Uh, the Ukrainian is somebody who's spoken about the potential of moving to Arsenal, who's never really shied away from the chat in the way others have in the past. He He's very open and honest. He, he talks uh, very candidly about his desire to eventually move on from Shakhtar Donetsk. But is this a deal that can be done in January based on the finances that would be required to do it? I've said to you guys before, and I'll say it again, despite Shakhtar Donetsk saying publicly that they'd be looking for 70, 80 million pounds, I honestly believe that if you turn up with a, a reasonable offer of around about 40, 45 million pounds, you can get this deal done. I used to say this to you guys about Martin Odegaard. Do you remember when Real Madrid was setting this ridiculous price? At the time, we were very interested and were, you know, adamant that they wouldn't budge from that, adamant that they wouldn't drop that at all. And Arsenal managed to get the deal done for circa £35 million. So I feel like the situation with Shakhtar is, is pretty similar. You know, we know of the problems in Ukraine. We know of the issues that Shakhtar are facing as a football club right now. And... Not that you want to take advantage of those situations or you want to be purposely taking advantage of people's misfortune and uh, and people's suffering, but Arsenal will look at this and think it's an opportunity. And when you add to the equation Mudrik's seeming willingness and desire to come to the Premier League and specifically Arsenal, this feels like something you've got to try and make happen and something that you've got to try and do. If Mudrik comes in, though, we're talking about a left winger. We're talking about a player who has pretty much throughout his entire career played from the left-hand side. Yes, he's got an eye for goal. Yes, he contributes uh, in terms of outputs in the final third, but he's not a central player. So that doesn't really solve our Jesus problem. But again, it's an alternative to Martinelli playing on the left, which again frees him up, which gives us an alternative option to Eddie and Ketia in the time being while we await Gabriel Jesus' uh, his return. So, it's a hard one, but according to some accounts and according to some reports, Arsenal have been working incredibly hard on this Mikhailo Mudrik deal in the past couple of weeks. Are they trying to get this ready and done ahead of um, ahead of the January transfer window so that once the window opens, they can strike straight away, get the deal done, job done, player comes in, Arsenal are, are stronger? Maybe. Uh, maybe. And we did see some interesting images, didn't we, over the past couple of days of uh, Arteta, Edu being out in LA with KSC. Um, and I'm sure there would have been some conversations about what's needed in January, about the success so far this season and what is required in light of all this news. Um, and in light of what we kind of already knew as well, that the fact that the squad was a little bit thin in certain areas, I'm sure there would have been conversations and discussions around about how to take Arsenal forward how to, um, you know, back the manager and give him what he needs in order to hopefully continue on this upward trajectory. Mikhailo Mudrik, I like him. I do. But I do have reservations about how quickly he will adapt to Premier League football. Did a show, uh, a show, a show what am I talking about? Did a show, did a show the other day uh, with Tom Canton on the Guna Talk TV. And we spoke about this. We spoke about a number of potential transfer targets. And when it came to Mudrik, I said he's someone that I feel would be worth a 40, 45 million pound punt. But no more than that. You know, I've I've seen some people talking about this guy being the next big thing, and he might well be. But looking at what I've seen of him so far, looking at the league he plays in, because that does play a part as well. You've got to look at his achievements and accomplishments, and you've got to assess them relative to the league and the competition that he's currently playing in. So 
I don't look at him and think, yep, this is an absolute banker, 100%. This would be a success, and we've got to make sure that we do our utmost to make it happen, and we've got to break the bank, and it's no problem if we overstretch ourselves because I think he's that damn good. This is a guy that I think could be that damn good, but I feel uncomfortable about the idea of going massive on him. You bring in a player for £40 million, it doesn't work out. You then sell him on for £15, £20 million a year, two years down the line. That's okay. For a club like Arsenal Football Club, that's absolutely fine. And that's the reality of, of how football works sometimes. You take gambles, you take calculated risks. Sometimes they pay off, sometimes they don't. But when you start going into that crazy territory like we did with Nicolas Pepe, then all of a sudden the pressure on that player is huge. If they don't deliver, you're stuck with them. I mean, we've got Nicolas Pepe out on loan. We've got following Balogun out on loan. People talking today about potentially bringing him back as a result of this Jesus injury. I understand why some would think that is the right thing to do. I understand why some would look at that and go, yeah, you know what? That's not a bad option. But by that same token, you've sent him out on loan for him to develop, for him to continue improving, for him to be in a position when that loan spell ends to come back and give you something. And if you cut that period short, you are, I think, hindering the player and it defeats the, the whole purpose of sending him out on loan in the first place. So I'm not for the idea of bringing Balogun back mid-loan. He's playing well. He's scoring goals. His confidence is rising. He's getting that vital experience that, you know, a lot of young academy players haven't had at the highest level, at, at top level. And um, yeah, you know, let him let him flourish, let him continue to develop and we'll get a much better player back for it in the end. So I don't want to see him pulled back at this stage. The question is, what do we do to cope with the forward thing? I think Mikel Arteta will trust Eddie Nketiah. I think he believes in Eddie Nketiah. I think it's why he made a big song and dance about keeping him. I think it's why they were happy to give him the contract that they did. Um, do I think that there are alternatives? I think there are alternatives. Yes, I think Martinelli is one of them. But I also read something earlier today that I thought was really, really interesting. And it was Ben Jacobs uh, from CBS Sports who was talking about Arsenal's interest in Mikhailo Mudrik. And he said that Mikel Arteta sees Mudrik as someone who he could potentially mould into a more central player. He sees him as someone who, yep, yeah, has been great as a left winger, but has all the attributes to be developed into someone who can play right across the front line. And I wonder if um, if that is true. And if it is true, then, you know, it, it would make sense. I think we all know, and I think we've all kind of gathered over the last few months that Arsenal going into the transfer market, um, you know, looking for a forward, they would be looking for someone who could ideally fill multiple positions across that front line, as opposed to someone who is just a right winger, just a left winger, or just a centre forward. So we'll have to see, um, you know, we'll have to see how that goes and and if this comes to anything. But I just thought it was interesting. Mudrik reminds me a bit of Cody Gakpo in that, yeah, he plays from the flank. And when you look at his position on paper, a starting position at least, and you look at where he's played most of his football, you see him as a wide man. But he's got that physical stature that suggests that if you did move him infield, he wouldn't be lost at sea in the way that sometimes when you bring a small winger in from a flank and, and ask them to play up against the centre-half, they just get lost a little bit. So, yeah, be interesting to see what happens. But look, I expect Arsenal to do business in January. I don't know how significant a business it will be. I don't know how much they'll be willing to spend. I think I read something that they were looking at around about £50 million spend, probably get a couple of decent players in for that. Uh, maybe one very good one, maybe one squad player. I don't know. Um, but what I will say is this, I don't believe, and this is just my opinion based on what I've heard and, and what I've been told and, and what I'm kind of gathering from reading between the lines. I don't think that the Gabby Jesus injury causes Arsenal to rip up the plans that were probably already in place going into January and, and rewrite them. So I think that we're not going to get a striker. I don't expect a striker to come in. I expect Arsenal to get by or try and get by based on what they currently have. And that is Enketia first and foremost. And then I think they will pull on the versatility 
of some of the other players in the group in an attempt to try and help Eddie and Ketia fill the very large boots of our Brazilian striker, Gabriel Jesus. So we've talked Jesus, we've talked Mudrik, let's quickly talk Tommy Asu, and then we're going to spend the last 10 minutes or so taking your questions and thoughts from the chat box. So if you've got any, start throwing them in there now, and I'll take out, uh, I'll take as many of those as I possibly can uh, between now and the end of the show. Don't forget, if you haven't done so already, uh, please leave a like on the video. It really, really does help. In fact, um, let's see where we're at. Uh, in terms of likes at the moment. There's nearly 300 of you with us live right now. We've only got 50 likes on the board. Come on, guys, let's get it up to 150. Likes are like the golden currency on YouTube. The more likes you put on a video, the the better it works with the algorithm, the higher it goes up in people's searches. The more eyes you get on it, the more subscribers you get, the quicker the channel grows. It's just the whole world of magic. So a like to you might seem like something very, very trivial, but to me, uh, it means the world. So please do leave a like on the video, subscribe to the channel if you're new as well. And um, yeah, looking forward to uh, getting back on it and bringing you guys daily content moving forward. Um, okay, let's talk Takahiro Tomiyasu just quickly because obviously Japan uh, crashed out of the World Cup yesterday. They were beaten on penalties by Croatia. Valiant display from the Japanese at these finals. They provided two huge shocks, didn't they? Um, beating Germany, beating Spain, but they couldn't beat Croatia despite taking the lead uh, in the round of 16. Takahiro Tomiyasu uh, was asked post-match uh, when he will return to Arsenal, who are, of course, in Dubai now uh, with their training camp underway. And he said this, I don't know, but hopefully I can get a bit of rest. I need time to forget about football. I need a bit of time. We just assume, don't we, as fans, that players are just absolute machines and robots and that they can flip from one competition to another, go from international competition to club competition without any breather, without any rest, without any break, without any mental effects. And I think it was actually quite nice to hear Tommy Asu be so open and honest. And listen, as far as I'm aware, Arsenal were planning to give the players at the World Cup a bit of extra time to get back anyway. Um, that was factored in uh, to the plans when they were made with regards to this Dubai training camp. Uh, we know that, um, you know, that they're going to get just a, a slightly extended leave of absence, which will help in terms of giving them some recovery time and some rest time. But at the same time, when Boxing Day comes and the Premier League returns, it returns thick and fast. And if we want to keep up the level that we've shown, if we want to sustain where we are in the Premier League, we haven't got time to sit around and wait for people to get themselves right. There will be individual cases where players need it more. For example, I reckon Granit Xhaka could play uh, the World Cup on, on a Monday and play for Arsenal on the Wednesday and he wouldn't give a shit because he's that type of guy. But there are others who need that break, who need that rest, who have really, I think, felt the pressures of performing for their countries on the world stage. And uh, and we have to be mindful that every case is different. I think it's interesting because I I wouldn't have thought of Tommy Asu as as one that would say something like this. But the fact that he has just kind of really hits home the point to me that footballers are human beings and footballers are not infallible. Footballers are not robots. Footballers are not machines. Um, even if you think they are sometimes based on the way they play. Uh, so yeah, interesting, interesting to see that Tommy Asu. Uh, made that clear. But as I say, although I think a lot of people were surprised to hear it or read it, uh, maybe taken aback a little bit by it, I think, as I say, it was in Arsenal's plans anyway to give these players just that little bit extra time uh, to rest and recuperate after um, after the World Cup uh, and between the conclusion of the tournament or, or their tournament, depending on how far their country go, and then, of course, the return of Premier League football. Uh, Stan, the man, just uh, on my point about moving Martinelli and, and changing things around up front to kind of live with the absence of Gabriel Jesus. He says there's too much at stake to start experimenting and converting players' positions at this stage of our season. Yeah, it's, it's a valid point to make. Uh, Jid says the Martinelli centre-forward experiment hasn't worked. Remember when Arteta made him train on his own with the striker coach, but he still came back and played centrally, do people really rate Eddie that low? 
It's not that I listen. Look, look at look at Jesus. What is it? Is it fifteen games without a goal? Is that right in all competitions? Have I just made that up off the top of my head? I know it's a it's an extended period of time in which Gabby Jesus hasn't scored a goal. Right, Eddie and Ketia definitely scores a goal in that period, playing in the first team, playing with Saka on the right, Martinelli on the left, Odegaard, Jaka, Partey behind him. He definitely scores more than that. Eddie and Ketia will score goals. Eddie and Ketia is a poacher. Eddie and Ketia comes alive inside the penalty area. My worry and my concern is not that Eddie and Ketia isn't a good striker, and it's not Eddie and Ketia won't score goals. It's more like our game is geared in a way that Gabriel Jesus is a huge part of. And what you're now asking Eddie and Ketia to do in order to maintain the way we've been playing and to bring some continuity to the situation, what you're asking Eddie and Ketia to do is to change his game. So even though you're saying we can't be experimenting with players' positions and we can't be doing this and we can't be doing that, whoever you put there that isn't Gabriel Jesus is going to have to adapt in some way. Otherwise, we have to adapt as a team. And is it easier for a team to adapt or is it easier for one individual to adapt and to to focus on a certain position, to focus on a certain style of play. That's the question that Mikel Arteta and his staff have to find the answer to. Um, But it's not that I don't rate Eddie. As I say, I think he'll score goals. I really do. I think at the back end of last season, when he came into the side and he came into the first team, not, you know, a, a Carabao Cup team or a Europa League team, I thought he did well. Nicholas Arthur says, uh, any chance Tyler Adams is back on the radar? He had a great World Cup. Um, yeah, he looked pretty good. He did. I think thought there was a lot of um, US players that looked pretty good, actually, and, and surprised me in a, in a really positive way. Um, but I, I think the one that Arsenal are probably more interested in than Tyler Adams, who's obviously uh, at Leeds United currently, is uh, Eunice Musa the man that Arsenal had and let go. I think he looks a real interesting talent, obviously playing in Spain with Valencia at the moment. Is that a deal that Arsenal could do? You know, I think what we've seen is a few players leave the club in recent years that probably shouldn't have been allowed to. And I think what part of the the restructure and part of the changes that we've seen behind the scenes is to prevent that happening moving forward. You know, we know that Edu's got a new role. We know that Per Mertesacker has done a a really good job bringing people through, but he needs to be singing from the same hymn sheet, essentially, as as the Edus and the Artetas of this world. And hopefully that doesn't happen again. But I haven't heard of anything regarding Tyler Adams for a long time. I have heard that Arsenal are looking at and scouting Eunice Musa again, uh, despite having him at the club in the past. I think, if I'm not mistaken, Fabrizio Romano put that sort of line out as well not too long ago. You can look that up, but yeah, I think Eunice Musa of the US uh, men's national team is probably the one that Arsenal have uh, the most interest in. Whether any of that materialises into anything, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Uh, Dave Atkinson says, Harry, do you think we should go for a lone player to fill in up front because we're going to be short in that position? We're certainly going to be short. You're absolutely right because an injury to Enketia now would leave us up shit street, wouldn't it? So, yeah, we should look. If there is the right player available on loan, I'm all for it. I'm all for it because with a loan deal as well, um, you're not you're not taking a huge deal of risk. You're not going and and, and panicking into bringing someone in that you're then going to be stuck with on a huge wage who you then can't move on, even though they were only there to serve a very short-term purpose. I think with a loan player, you get, well, you have that ability, don't you, to to send them back at the end of the term. Um, and it's a, a minimal investment in terms of what you lay out financially. Um, I can't believe that some people in the chat are asking if we should go for Cristiano Ronaldo. Absolutely not. It's taken Fernando Santos a while, uh, the Portuguese boss, but he's obviously uh, realised that Cristiano Ronaldo is just a bit of a man-child at the moment, and he dropped him uh, from the side that's playing Switzerland tonight from the starting eleven. That game's going to kick off in around about 15 minutes. So we'll wrap up very shortly. Um, Let's see uh, what else we've got in the chat. I'll pick up one or two more. Um, 
John Renee says, damn, I'm just tuning in. This is not the news I wanted to hear. You and me both, my man. You and me both. Um, Blue Streak says, Harry looks like a Kryptonian from the old Superman movie. I promise I'll fix the lights. <laughs> if I had a pound for everybody that's commented about my floating head on this video tonight, uh, I'd be a millionaire. Uh, what else have we got? Let's take one or two more of your questions. Um, Temi Ola says, this is an interesting one. Can Memphis Depay do a good job alone? Thoughts? I like Memphis Depay. I do. I watched the Dutch's first match of the tournament against, um, who was it? Who was it they played first up in the World Cup? Qatar played Ecuador. And that, yeah, it was Holland against Senegal. And I thought that Depay, you know, not being in the team was was a miss for them. You know, he was a real, it was a real blow not to have him. I watched their game against Ecuador and again, he didn't play and I didn't think that they were particularly dangerous going forward. Cody Gakpo as an individual obviously has been impacting football matches, but I thought I didn't watch their game against Qatar, but I watched their game um, in the round of 16 against the US and I just thought he brought a quality and a, a touch and a, a a, a bit of stardust to their forward line. I really like Memphis Depay. I do. I think he's a great player, great set piece taker as well. I think he's got a lot about him, but it's a big but. Will he press? Will he do all of that side of things? I don't think he does. I don't think he's that type of player. And so, yeah, while he'd bring a bit of quality to the final third, I think it would impact our game model. We're very much in a situation at Arsenal now where we have a style. And we need to recruit to that style. We need to bring in players who will take that style on, fit into the position and not impact the success of the players around them, the success that's been built on playing in a certain way. Some people are talking about João Felix, a player that I really like. He's a very hard worker. I think he could easily do a job in that position. But is that a deal that we can realistically do in January? I don't think it is, um, which is why I'm a little bit reluctant to kind of go down that uh, particular rabbit hole. Uh, Dominic Zoboslai, again, good player, but doesn't fit the role that I think we're desperate for now with Jesus's injury. Um, Olise has been mentioned by Usman as well. Not He's not quite there yet for me. He's just not quite there. Um, let's see. Let's see. Uh, I'll take one more. Um, Harvey, just to finish off, says, who do you think will win tonight, Portugal or Switzerland? I think the Portuguese edge it ever so. I think it'll be ever so close. I think this will be a really boring game. Probably famous last words. As a betting man, I've bet under two and a half goals on this one. Just don't see there being a lot of goals. I think you're talking about two very pragmatic sides. The Portuguese just have that additional bit of quality, don't they, in the final third. So, Maybe that'll make the difference. Wishing our boy Granite Jacker, of course, the best of luck this evening. Right, I am going to leave it there because I'm going to uh, get off and watch the uh, the Portugal versus Switzerland game. We'll be back tomorrow with another bit of content. We're going back to daily um, and, uh, yeah, looking forward to getting back on it as the return of Premier League football uh, approaches. What is it, three weeks away? Something like that. It's not a million miles away. Is it sooner rather than later? Arsenal will be back in action. There's some friendlies coming up as well, which will, of course, keep you right across. And I'll be back tomorrow with more. Until next time, take care of yourselves and stay safe. All the best. Don't forget to leave a like. Don't forget to subscribe. Goodbye. Cheers. I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon.